Well, good morning. Thank you for joining the parade at Grace United Church in Sarnia. My name is Kenji Marui. My pronouns are he and him, and I am part of the pastoral team with Pat Morrison. We minister together with all of you in this congregation that is an inclusive intergenerational community partner. We are an affirming ministry that believes the love of God seeks out and accepts all people regardless of sexual orientation or gender expression. Understanding that our common human journey requires respect and compassion and care for one another. It's more important than the labels that society puts on us or even the ones that we make for ourselves. Welcome to worship. Our announcements are in the weekly email message that gets sent from the church office. If you prefer or require a paper copy, some of those are available in uh, the narthex in the church lobby behind you. Uh, we hereby give first notice of a congregational meeting to be convened on Sunday, April the 7th, 2024, immediately following the worship service. And the purpose of the meeting is to consider the following motion moved that Grace United Church extend a provisional call to Pat Morrison toward his ordination in the United Church of Canada, which will become effective on the date of his celebration of ministry service. So for more information on what this exactly means and on Pat's call to ordained ministry, the process moving forward, and the implications for Grace, please refer to information in that email blast that I mentioned, or uh, you can go straight to the horse's mouth and talk to Pat himself. Uh, Bev Walkling has a minute to share with us about uh, an event coming up in April. Good morning, everybody. I am hoping that you have been noticing signs like this around the church. I want to tell you about our uh, upcoming fundraiser, which is a pasta fest done in conjunction with the Dante Club. This is a major fundraiser that we are hoping to use to help support the work that needs to be done in our parking lot, which will include painting new lines on and things like that. So we are counting on your help to make this be a success. Um, there is a, an event on our church Facebook page, and if you're on Facebook, if you go in there, there is this poster, and you can copy and save it, or you can just share it directly to your friends, ask them to share it as well, so we can get the word out to as many people as possible that this is happening. The cost is $15 per person, and for that you get um, pasta uh, with two meatballs and um, focaccia bread and um, it's curbside pickup. We will need a couple of volunteers to help with curbside pickup so if that's something that might interest you that will be between about 5 and 6 30 p.m. on Thursday April 18th and um, you can place your order after church if you want. Bill and Yvonne are here to uh, collect names and, and uh, money, <laughs> if you've got it handy. Um, and also, um, I'm hoping that April 12th is when all the orders have to be in. It would be nice if we could get a few of these posters taken out if you know somewhere that um, one could be posted, we can see about getting one to you. Um, so hopefully we will uh, have a great success with this one and help cover these costs for the parking lot. And thank you so much for participating. Now, I, I also wanted to let the congregation know that uh, we will be um, taking, setting up photo sessions for a new photo directory of uh, the congregation of Grace United Church. I think the last one was in 2018, and since then, uh, I'm new on the staff team. Mark is new on the staff team, and uh, we will have a new office administrator uh, for whom uh, such a directory would be, I think, quite helpful. And to tell you more about the uh, office administrator and the search and the successful uh, candidate, uh, John Scott representing that committee will be making that introduction. Um, April will mark a major transition in the church office. During the month, there will actually be two people working there. As Lori approaches her retirement, she will be mentoring 
our new office administrator. We look forward to celebrating Lori's retirement, and we welcome Kathy Dodkin as her, in her new role. This morning, it's my pleasure to introduce Kathy Dodkin. Thank you, John. Welcome, Kathy. Congratulations, I think. I hope. I hope. <laughs> On the occasion of this Palm Sunday, I acknowledge that this land of maple trees and Carolinian forest is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples. The four sacred medicines of their teachings are the leaves of tobacco for thanksgiving, cedar for healing and purification, sage for cleansing, and sweet grass for calming and grounding tranquility. Understanding the connectedness between creation and humanity broadens our awareness and openness to possibility and promise of reconciled relationships. Please join me in our call to worship that will appear on the screen before you. As we engage in this responsive reading, I'll invite the junior choir to come forward and get ready for their anthem. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. We will journey through praise with joy on our lips. We will travel through betrayal and death, cradling hope deep in our hearts. Jesus leads us through this week and we will follow, for he is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. We wave palm branches in anticipation. We lay our love before him to cushion his walk. Setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes, modeling humbleness and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who brings us the kingdom of God.
Let us pray. God of all times and all places, we gather as your people, joining hearts with those who have gone before us, right back to those who stood alongside the road shouting Hosanna. Our lives jump for joy as we celebrate the coming of the sovereign of our hearts, meeting him in our worship, meeting you in our worship, meeting each other in our worship. Bless us, we pray. Bless also the extravagant gifts of our lives, what we share of ourselves for the sake of Christ's shared life. We pray that our gifts may work for the poor, for your greater glory, in every place and time. Amen. So during this church season of Lent, as the days have been lengthening, as we've been preparing for Easter to arrive, we've had a few people, uh, members or people connected to the church, share a story about an experience they had about God present in their lives. And uh, this morning features uh, probably, yeah, the, the youngest story that we'll have this morning. Um, ben Parkinson will, is doing double duty. He's in the booth. He will be sharing his story. And uh, as, as you know, um, I had, uh, had, had implemented three rules for, for such sharing. One, it had to be a true story. Two, it had to be your story. Couldn't be somebody else's. And three, it had to be about God. You couldn't be the hero of your own story. No, we were going to put our focus and attention on the divine. And uh, I asked Ben, and uh, right away he said yes. And then a few minutes later he said, and this is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted for you to be able to hear what he has to share and uh, as we have been doing, we've been sending in advance uh, to all of our speakers uh, good intention, positivity, support, and care. Uh, we send it in, in, in the way of warmth and, and good vibrations as, as we kind of take our hands and put all our support and care and love and good intention and just rub and rub and rub and get a real heat going. And then we're sending that heat, that warmth through the space toward Ben, that he might feel that in anticipation of his time here. So please, Ben, come on forward. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm Ben Parkinson, and as many of you may know, I've been a part of this church now for quite some time. I didn't understand why I kept coming to church until recently. Um, in the past few years, I've been thinking more and more about why do bad things happen to good people. This is something that I think most of the population struggles with for any number of reasons. Um, I didn't understand, and to be honest, I still don't fully understand, but for the longest time I was furious that God or whatever supreme being, whatever omnipotent being was shaping our lives could let these things happen to good people. Um, even if they'd done nothing wrong, something seemed to happen. 
And eventually, as with most people, I had some sort of a faith crisis. I started to question, what if God doesn't exist? Um, and what should I do with my religion? Should I keep coming to church? What would I do if I lost all my connections with these people? Um, I'm not quite sure how it started, but sooner than I would have liked, or sooner than anyone would have liked, these fears and doubts morphed into anxieties. These anxieties morphed into paranoia. I stopped sleeping, and I began to struggle with what I now know to be depression. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's too long of a story. Um, there was nothing, nothing, no one, there was nowhere that could have helped me. Um, I ended up in the hospital for some time, and during my stay there, I visited with Pat, and he helped me goof off and helped me to kind of get a grasp on what was happening. My parents also visited me every single day. Um, I had these meaningful discussions, and this led me to trying to talk to pigeons. I know it sounds strange, but I couldn't help but wonder what they would say to me. I, I do truthfully believe that it was this connection, this connection to nature that I was trying to make. For the first time in months, I did something that I hadn't done. I felt. I started to cry. I hadn't been feeling for, well, from September up until April. There was nothing. And then all of a sudden, there was this deep, not an emotion, not, not a physical, not emotional. It, but I, can't, I can't exactly place words into it. But it was warm, and it was, the closest word is joyful. It was happy. Um, this, as I said, caused me to cry. But it wasn't sad, it was more relief. Relief that I was feeling because there was something that made me think this might end up okay. Um, this is what drove me to continue doing what I was doing, to continue to try. This reignited, this relit, this kindled the faith back into, okay, so I'm going to church, and I don't understand it. I don't think I ever will. But I do know that the people here will care, and they do try. And that is what keeps me coming back, is the people. Um, this is only one small part of my 17 years of stories, but I would tend to believe that this is one of the more important ones. Thank you, Ben. So important. May the peace of Christ be with you, and I invite you to share the peace with one another.
Peace be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give God thanks and praise. Yes, I brought Kleenexes because I have a very sad story to tell. If you are a crier, if you cry easily like I do, you might want a tissue. Or you can decide as the story unfolds if there's a touching moment and you need a tissue. Um, the story goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Patrick. The end. <laughs> Isn't that a good story? What is it about? What it, well, I just told you the story. That's the end. What? The end? Yeah. How is that sad? You didn't have the, you didn't, you didn't have the, like, the part where you like, you didn't have the story part. You just had the beginning to the end of it. You need the part in the middle where, like, the emotional kind of Oh, okay. So a story has a beginning in a middle. Okay. So once upon a time, there was a little boy named Patrick, and he was so handsome. And <laughs> he was sitting in the kitchen eating a hot dog. The end. That was a good story. That, I thought that's a great story. No? It's a great story. There's no emotion? He's just eating a hot... That's a happy emotion. All right. <laughs> okay, okay, this is getting better. Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Patrick who was sitting in the kitchen eating a hot dog with bacon on it. When in comes his older pesky brother, Bradley. That's my brother. And he grabs the salt shaker, unscrews the lid, and he poured it on my head. The end. How is that? That is hilarious. You have, you, have, you have the start, you have the middle, and you have the end. You need to make, you can't just leave a cliffhanger. That's the worst thing that ever happens. You've got to finish it. <laughs> this isn't even staged. <laughs> it's not sad at all. It's not sad, well, okay. Because um, it gets better. Well, I'll ask you, how does this story end? Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Patrick sitting in the kitchen, eating a hot dog with bacon on it, when in come his pesky older brother, who takes a salt shaker, screws off the lid, and pours the salt on Patrick's head. And then you take the pepper shaker, unscrew the lid, and pour it on his head. <laughs> no. <laughs> pour yeah. up his nose. Or you punch him. Either one. Pour it up his nose. <laughs> oh, yeah, quick. Dump it on his nose. Don't you he would be, <laughs> he'd be sneezing quickly, wouldn't he? <laughs> Okay, there is there is an ending. What's a uh, what's a different ending? Don't you punch him? Yeah. Um, the dog comes in after he put all the pepper on, and Brennan's head hits the dog. The dog like dog. The night stand. He makes off all the pepper on Brennan's head. So after I pour the pepper on Brad's head, the dog comes in. The dog doesn't like salt but loves pepper and licks all the pepper off of Brad's head. <laughs> the end. You got another one? Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe like after you like pour the salt, after, uh, after he pours the salt on your head, you punch him. Then you get in trouble by your parents. And then you, after you are done with getting in trouble, you grab the pepper, pour it on his head, then the dog happens, and then you got to go to your room for three hours. That's closer to what happened. <laughs> That's closer to the truth. Um, but you got one more? I have one too. Then you can't come in and then you, and then you like Yeah, uh, parents came in and we both get grounded. Uh, back then, I don't understand this, but when we were in trouble, we were sent to a corner, and we had to put our nose in the corner. Mm. What I don't get it. What I know. What I, here's what I want to say to you. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
we start a story today that includes these things. Today is Palm Sunday, and we started a story. And a week from now, we're going to be back here, and we're going to be talking about... The same story? No. We're going to be talking about... A different story? A different story that's connected to this story. Across this week, as we remember our Bible story, a lot of stuff is going to happen. And just like my brother pouring salt on my head, there are some really <coughs> terrible things that happen in the Bible story. There are horrible things that unfold. But here's what I want you to know. When horrible things unfold, that's not the end of the story. There's still more to come. When my children were young and we would watch movies and something horrible would happen, I would say to them, wake up now and pay attention. This isn't the end. Pay attention. When nasty unfolds, it's not the end of the story. We don't get to quit, right? When we all were in seminary and studied Paul Tillich, and he said, faith is courage to continue to be in the face of non-being. It's not the end of the story. We keep going. We're going to come back here on Good Friday and we're going to hear some horrible stuff and it's not the end of the story. Let's meet back here next week and find out what the end of the story tastes like. Hopefully a lot better than a head full of salt and pepper. I'll see you back here in a week. Before we head out to children's worship, let's stand and exchange blessings with the big peoples. The big peoples are out there and up here. Your loudest voice. May God bless you as you stay to hear God's word. On your mark, get set, go. Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem to great public fanfare. Yet, it is the quiet intimacy of a private encounter that recognizes the true significance of this moment in his ministry. From the Good News translation of the Gospel of Mark, let us hear the living word of God. Starting with chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem, near the towns of Bethphage and Bethany, they came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks you why you are doing that, say that the master needs it and we'll send it back at once. So they went and found a colt out in the street, tied to the door of a house. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders asked them, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered just as Jesus had told them, and the crowd let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks over the animal, and Jesus got on. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches in the field and spread them on the road. The people who were in front and those who followed behind began to shout, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord! God bless the coming kingdom of King David our father! Praise to be to God! Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and looked around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the 12 disciples. Our reading moves on to chapter 14, verses 3 to 9. Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, a man who had suffered from a dreaded skin disease. While Jesus was eating, a woman came in with an alabaster jar full of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. Some of the people there became angry and said to one another, 
What was the use of wasting the perfume? It could have been sold for more than 300 silver coins and that money given to the poor. And they criticized her harshly. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a fine and beautiful thing for me. You will always have the poor people with you, and any time you want to, you can help them, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body to prepare it ahead of time for burial. Now I assure you that wherever the gospel is preached all over the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. As we remember the story of Jesus' life and the many people who honored and glorified him, let us hold fast to the compassion and love that guided his ministry. In a culture of critique and criticism, let us be open to the gift of generosity and personal growth through change. Let us pray. Holy God, may we give fully of ourselves in abundance and extravagance for the sake of our faith, for our belief in your purpose, for knowing that the setback is not the end of the story. This morning we ask that the prayers that we pray, the songs that we sing, and the words that we say and hear be blessed by you, O God, our strength, our refuge, and our redeemer. Amen. I once witnessed the most cringe-inducing gift exchange at an office Christmas party almost 20 years ago. The rules seemed standard. People drew names and purchased or made a gift worth $20 for the name that they drew. Now, during the gift giving and unwrapping, co-workers received sincere and somewhat meaningful gifts, teapot, foot bath, shot glasses, paintball pellets, a poster of babies playing jazz, a handmade oven mitt, and a video iPod, the latest shiny innovation from Apple Computer Incorporated. Yes, for whatever reason, the office manager decided that he would flout the previously agreed upon spending limit and flaunt his wealth and generosity in a public show of extravagance that fomented muttering and murmuring among the masses. He gave a gift worth 20 times more than anything everyone else brought, upsetting the social contract and creating feelings of resentment and low-level rage. 
The more things change, the more they stay the same. Now, as you may have surmised, my sermon will focus on the intimate interlude of anointing in Bethany instead of Jesus, uh, the Jesus cult riding parade into Jerusalem. I was caught more by the deep devotion of the unnamed woman than the shallow public acclaim of the crowd crying Hosanna. For all the instances that Mark describes the disciples as obtuse and unaware of the true meaning of Jesus' purpose and passion, we have this account of one woman who understood. She heard and she took seriously Jesus' prediction of his own death. She demonstrated that knowledge in her actions, in her devotion, in her dedication. In this version of the story, she has no name. Luke's gospel identifies her as Mary of Bethany, sister to Martha and Lazarus, as the hymn we just sang relates. Religious tradition also portrays this woman as Mary Magdalene. But for me, I find appeal in her anonymity, that she can be as ordinary as anyone else in the crowd of his followers. Now, I don't dismiss her as a nobody. Like, of course, she was a somebody, one lost to us through history and patriarchy. But she didn't leverage any special status as a close and familiar friend of Jesus to pay him honor. She was just someone who listened and believed. That could be any of us. And so an implicit invitation is extended to every one of us in our ordinariness to feel deeply and respond. For this woman, she was compelled to anoint Jesus into death with costly perfume. She transgresses boundaries for the sake of faith in the same way that Jesus did. Entering Simon's home, she risked not only her health and well-being, but any social standing because of that dreaded skin disease, jeopardizing her personal freedom of movement because active cases of leprosy required quarantine and containment in cast-off colonies. That the community knew him by his affliction meant the taint of impurity and illness lingered. As a woman approaching a man, she defied social convention. Interrupting his meal, she unseals an alabaster jar of pure nard which derives from a plant ingredient imported from the Himalayan region of India, distilled into perfume of extravagant wealth. She pours out the whole thing, empties the jar on Jesus. Now, if the cost of her action wasn't startling enough, its quantity and excess shocked even the bougiest of bystanders. Like, imagine an entire bottle of Shamuk by Nabil, or Golden Delicious by Donna Karen, New York, or Les Larmes Sacrées de Teb by Baccarat, or One Million Lux edition by Paco Rabanne, none of which I have in my um, medicine cabinet. <laughs> Imagine an entire bottle of that up and up uncapped and upended, thousands, millions even of dollars dumped in one odiferous olfactory offering. This woman, just brought an Apple video iPod to an office party's Christmas gift exchange. I'm curious about Jesus' response because so much of his ministry focused on the needy and the poor, and putting himself before their needs seems out of character. Like, if we had only this story about Christ, he would seem a megalomaniac me first messiah, reeking of entitlement and privilege, willing to let the poor continue to suffer, hungry and unsheltered, while he luxuriated in opulence. Now, thankfully, we possess more than this single story about the nard-soaked Nazarene. And within the broader perspective and the fuller account of Jesus' life, we also know that he will defend the honor of the accosted and the falsely accused. He praises the woman for the wonderful gift she gave, offering everything that she had. Like the widow at the temple who also gave everything that she had, except hers was a gift of two coins, mere pennies. The magnitude of the gift invites scrutiny and suspicion. 
And Jesus receives it in the spirit with which it was given, reverently and lovingly. Giving an extravagant gift is fraught for both giver and receiver. Like the giver wants to express love, admiration, gratitude, care, support, celebration, or congratulations. But if the gift is, is too much, did they misread the situation? Did they misread the nature of the relationship? Will it make things weird? Will ulterior motives be read into the gift? What if the recipient doesn't like or want the gift that costs so much? The receiver experiences a similar barrage of questions. How much did this cost? How can I repay it? How can I return the favor in equal amount? Are they buying me off? Like, what is the catch? What do they want from me? What did I do to deserve this? And what do I do now? Jesus demonstrates to us how to receive a gift of great value with kindness and genuine appreciation, mirroring the emotion and intention of the giver. He demonstrates grace, the very theological concept that this church is named after. He accepts the perfumed gift at face value, validating the sacrifice that the woman made for his behalf. He sees her. He accepts and appreciates her. She blessed him beyond measure, and all he needed to do was accept the gift, receive it. In turn, through his life and death and resurrection and rising, he gives us the gift of life over death. Jesus gives us hope for a future. Jesus presents possibility and promise that cannot be conquered by the evil ways of the world. God's Son grants us grace. Grace is undeserved and unwarranted blessing given without conditions attached. Grace cannot be earned. It is freely available for any and all. Grace only needs to be received, only needs to be accepted, only needs to be believed. Grace arrives in the unexpected call from a friend at the right time. Grace lives in kindness and compassion expressed out of nowhere. Grace flies in the form of a pigeon preening its feathers by a hospital ward window. Grace is priceless because it can't be bought. It has no price to pay. Which is not to say that grace doesn't have a cost. But that cost was borne by our Savior, by Jesus himself, who took unto himself the weight of the world's hurt and shame and ugliness and hatred. And Jesus who gave his life, dying for the sake of our lives, that we might live in hope and peace and love and joy in faith forever. Grace is having access to the infinite and eternal love and life of God. Grace is the video iPod unwrapped at an office Christmas party. Grace is you granting me forgiveness when I confess that I stole that story from season two, episode 10 of the American sitcom, The Office. <laughs> Although I didn't lie, I said I witnessed this cringe-inducing event. I just didn't say I witnessed it on my TV screen on a Tuesday night during prime time. Grace is you overlooking my misdirection and laughing along good-naturedly, thank you and not questioning every other story that I have ever told. Grace is forgiveness and forbearance and God's favor. Grace is more than a stylized logo on blue t-shirts. Grace is the people wearing them. Grace is this church and every community of faith that proclaims a life worth living in Christ. There's lots of us out there, and grace is knowing that we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, 
to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Creator God, you give us days filled with parades, bands, and balloons. You walk with us through days when we are overwhelmed with pain, with doubt, with heartache. We rely on your presence. Your arrival in our lives brings grace and goodness. Rider of humbleness, trusting God, you offer your life so that we may no longer fear death. Loving God, you challenge the powers of the world. God, you reveal faithfulness to us. We would give fully in extravagance to honor you. Wisdom's richness, you come to us with arms full of joy, spreading it on our path. You take us by the hand to travel with us through this week. We would empty ourselves so that we could make room for you in our hearts. Hear the many prayers that we offer today for all the places of trouble in the world, in Russia and Ukraine, in Haiti. We pray for the people who are in our hearts and on our minds. Pray for Betty and Brian Brad, Carrie, Kathy, and Donna, Dawn, Jerry, Marion, Robbie, Sheila, and Todd, Holly, Laura. Pray for Deb, Tracy, Sophia, Hannah, Shelley, and Kathy. Pray for Evelyn, and John, Janice. Pray for Dave. We pray for George. We pray in silence for the prayers that continue to rest in our hearts. Loving God, we gather all of our prayers in the words that your Son, the Anointed One, taught us. To you, our provider and our parent, our maker and our mother, our faith and our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
We entered into Jerusalem and experienced the festivities, if only in our imagination. We caught a glimpse of the one who the crowds were proclaiming Messiah. We could almost smell the perfumed ointment that filled the room of Simon's home. Today we encountered the timeless tale of Palm Sunday, inspired, encouraged, and transformed by this faith story. We go as faith-filled people to be generous with our kindness, to be radical in our loving, to be tender in our compassion. And may the God of the journey go with us this holy week. May the Christ of vulnerability show us the way that we must go. And may the delightful Holy Spirit always be our guide. Amen.